In this video, we are going to go over the summary of my learnings from chapter 5 of building data intensive applications. So chapter 5 is all about replication. To understand why is replication important, let's take an example. Let's say you're trying to book a meeting room for a very important event. And you go to your website and you try to book the room. And you get a confirmation that you got the room. Let's say you show up to that room for that same meeting invite and someone else says they also got the same room. You wouldn't want that to happen, right? Your website and your database systems, your applications should be aware that there is a conflict and that it shouldn't allow for two people to book the same room. There's many aspects involved here, but there's a big aspect of data and data replication that's important here that will enable that your website doesn't resolve into conflicts. So let's go into this chapter, learn everything about replication, at least from the vocabulary standpoint, and get into it. So replication, let's understand why it's important. So for that, let's start with this diagram here. So let's say you are a user of your website and uh, you have a website with one machine and one database. Everything is good, right? If you're one user, one machine, website, and one database, everything's fine. But let's say you have to scale it up to now support millions of users. Then you cannot just serve it with one machine. You probably need multiple machines. So then you, you, your website machines increases. You go from one machine to multiple machines, maybe hundreds of machines. And then similarly, you cannot just support everything with one database. Now you need hundreds of databases, right? And so you would also want to make sure that your users are now split across certain machines, like machine one, and then certain machines, certain users go to this machines and certain users go to this machine, right? So when you, when you divert your traffic in such a way, you also want to make sure that the user that goes here, and if the same user goes to this machine, because let's say this machine went down, that that data goes from the database one to database two, right? So that whole process of syncing the data from certain databases in, in certain data centers to certain other machines is called replication. So when a user goes from either to this website, this machine, or this website with this machine, it probably gets the same data. And that happens because there is a bridge of data replication happening between these databases. So when certain machines go down, your website still continues to work with other machines. So this whole process to ensure that your data is replicated or copied, replication nothing but copied, in a consistent way across multiple databases is replication. And so why is this needed? We talked about scaling, right? If you have multiple users, you need multiple machines serving multiple users. That's one reason, but there's many reasons, right? Think about this. What if this network link between yourself and the website goes down and your, web, and your applic application becomes offline? You still need your users to be able to send offline emails so your Outlook supports offline access. So the network could go down or the network could become slow. You still need your website to continue to work. There could be a failure in the machine itself. If a machine goes down, you want to move your users from the, that machine to the other machine and your website should still continue to work. So there could be machine failures because of many reasons. One simple reason is, let's say the disk is full and the machine can no longer write to it. It's a very simple machine, machine failure, right? There could be issues with uh, how the hardware misfunction, right? So there are many reasons why machines can fail. And so that's why you need ways to move users from one machine to the second machine that uses probably some other databases. We talked about scale, multiple users. The other factor is latency. So let's look at why latency is important. Let's say this user is in the United States and this user is in India. You want these machines closer to this users and these machines closer to these machines. So geographically, these machines need to be separate. That's why, again, you, it requires you to separate these machines into different data centers, different locations. And so you would want the data closer to the, to the web, web, web services that are serving this data. So latency is very important. If you, if you ask every user from around the world to go to the US data center, then it's gonna be very hard. So latency, to serve for latency, you'll have, you want to support geographically distributed set of um, data centers that are closer to the users. 
We talked about offline and network failures. So for all of these reasons are required, um, are, are, are what causes replication to be required, right? You need replication to support uh, failures on all of this or to support all of these capabilities. So now that we've looked at why is replication needed, what are some other reasons, let's look at three different configurations in which replications can take place. We can have a leader, single leader replication. It's also called as active passive replication. So active is the leader in black and blue ones are the passive ones. This is also called the master slave configuration. So that's number one, single leader. A leader in this case is the leader. It's called the leader because it takes all the rights. So let's say we have users denoted in black uh, who are writing and users denoted in blue who are reading, right? So you have a read or a write happening. I'm gonna break this down. And I'm only gonna use the databases because we're gonna go in detail of database replication. Web services, web, web services scaling we have looked at into other videos. So now we are just focusing on how database replication works. So now let's look at if there are two replicas, you have two replicas and you have one leader. In the single leader replication, all the blacks are the rights, all the R's, blues are the reads. So all rights go to the leader. That's configuration is called the single leader replication. And the leader, so when the first write comes in, it goes to the leader and the leader is responsible to replicate it to the replica one, replica two. So all the writes go to the leader and then the writes are replicated or copied to the replicas. The leader can take the reads as well, but to optimize, typically the way this is optimized is you make sure all of your writes go to the leader and the other replicas are serving the reads because typically most use cases is in the internet uh, scale websites like uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, and others, there's much more reads than writes. So then you'd wanna have multiple replicas. So this is called the single leader replication with, or the active passive or the master slave configuration. One leader responsible for all the writes and that leader is responsible for copying all the data or replicating all the data to re replicas, right? So there are many details here that we'd have to think. Think about it. When the write comes through, should the user see the acknowledgement that the write went through before it has replicated? What if the user goes from this replica, to, from this leader, to reading from this replica? If the data has not propagated, should we still wait? So that's the dichotomy between synchronous versus asynchronous replication. So in synchronous application, in replication, the user will wait until all the replicas have, have responded saying, hey, this is, this is already written, and that can have a huge impact on latency and availability. So that's synchronous versus async uh, replication. So you'll have to factor in how, what, is, what are the parameters important to you? How much available you want the system to be? How much, this also gives you the facility to tell to the user when, when your replica writes failed or your writes fail. You can tell the user that, hey, you try again. There was some issue, there was some conflict. Also, there's a lot of lag, right? When you write from to the leader, to the replica and back, there's a lot of lag. That's called the replication lag. And you'd want to monitor it so that you check that your replicas are not falling behind. And you'd, you can measure it through various ways. So replication lag is an important concept to measure how behind are your replicas from your leader. In the topology, replication topology is basically how your data is flowing. Who's responsible to do the replication? Is the leader responsible to do the replica to all replicas or is the replica then responsible to replica to other replicas, right? So that is called replication topology. Again, there are various configurations, but the trade-off is between durability, availability, and latency, right? If you wait for all the replicas to get the right, then you are giving huge amount of durability, but at the expense of lower availability and higher latency. So these configurations, all of this is important to keep in mind. And what happens in the biggest issue with the single leader is what happens when the leader goes down. Let's say this thing goes down, what happens? When this happens, now you have to change the leader to one of these other replicas. So the first thing you'd have to do is you'd have to first detect that the leader went down. When the leader goes down, then you have to nominate a new leader. When you nominate a new leader, you have to snapshot all the data, you have to then copy the data, then you have to wait for the replica to catch up. So that is the biggest drawback to think about when you have a single leader replication system 
the leader failing over has a huge issue. It is a lot of manual process involved potentially, but it can also be automated. And think about this, uh, even the replication itself, there's various algorithms that are in mind that you have to keep in mind. How do you want to replicate? Do you want to copy all the data or the statements on SQL updates from the leader to, rep to the replica as is? That could have impact because if you have dynamic statements, then the replicas could have different values than the leader. You could also have write ahead log that we discussed in the previous video that you ship across and it just ships all the values from the leader to the replicas. But then again, it is very system specific, uh, software specific, version specific that has issues. You could ship logic base, which just says, what are the fields that need to be updated? And then they could have variations, but the data remains consistent. And then trigger base, which is probably the most ideal where you have database triggers that identify what data has have Data, data columns have changed and then you can move them from certain leaders to the replicas based on logic, logic based, but also trigger based on certain systems and tools that the database vendors provide. Like for example, Oracle has Oracle Golden Gate and Databus, which allows for uh, replication tools and algorithms to happen between uh, leaders and the replicas. So we went through a lot of detail on the single leader replication. There are two others. Uh, Multi-leader, like the single leader, multi-leader is, is where you have multiple leaders, right? And the blue are ones that are serving the read, black leaders is serving the writes. So the main difference between single leader and the multi-leader is that there are multiple leaders who can take the writes, right? And there are multiple replicas. So when you see this configuration, when there are multiple leaders, typically what happens is they, these are in different data centers. This is, let's say, in the US data center, this is an Asia data center. And so then you are keeping these users closer to the data center, but then there could be issues. Let's say the user goes here into this data center and writes something here. And then the user goes and, and tries to read it from this data center. If the writes have not propagated all the way to all of the replicas, but also propagated to this, um, leader data database, then they will see data that is not uh, consistent with what they expect. So conflict and also data availability between multiple um, leaders is the key factor to keep in mind. There could also be conflict. Let's say this is a database that supports taking money out. And if a user is pinned to this data center and stakes out $100, then it goes to this data center and then takes out another $100, you want $200 to be deducted. But if it doesn't happen correctly in the right sequence, then that could have conflicts and that could have issues. So conflict resolution and what algorithms you have in place to resolve conflicts is a key important factor. And also which right actually wins. Let's say this user writes to this data center, same user goes and writes here, and if they write two different things on the same field, which one would win? And even within the data center, which one would win? So there's conflict resolution that, that's important. Quorum as to how, what is the right answer when there are multiple conflicts is an important area to keep in mind. Overall, this, this, this topic is around convergence. How does this data converge, right? From one data center to the other data center. What are the streams of things that need to happen between these two data centers to make sure that eventually this entire multiple data centers actually stay consistent so that the user sees the same view? Because it could very well happen that this data center goes out completely. There could be a power failure and this entire data center goes up. So you then have to move all of your users from this data center to the other data center. And they might have removed $100 when they only had $100 in their account. And they go to this data center, it shows that they have another $100 that they can take out, right? So data center failover with conflict resolution is an important area to keep in mind for multi-leader replication systems. The final one is leaderless, where there is no leader. So the, re, the application owner or the client is responsible to write to all the replicas and also read from all replicas. And there is a specific configuration where you could say, hey, what are my reads? What are my writes? And if, I, if my total is greater than the total number of nodes, then, there's, uh, then it's okay because you'll have the latest information in at least one of those replicas, right? So the onus on leaderless replication system is much more on the application. They are responsible to do all the writes across all replicas and all reads across all replicas. And then they have to do resolve conflicts as well, because let's say some of this machine 
actually went down and it only got acknowledgements for three, then there has to be logic in place that says if I get at least three out of four acknowledgements, then this my right has gone through. Or if I read three out of four, then, then it's okay, right? So Amazon Dynamo is the closest uh, example for leaderless replication. And most of these variants like Voldemort, Cassandra and others also use leaderless replication. This provides for a huge amount of uh, resilience when it comes to read and write, but conflict resolution becomes even harder, right? Think about it. Let's say um, you, you write something to, let's say this user writes something to this replica and it tries to read the same data, then they should get the same data that they wrote. That property is called read after write consistency, right? So what you read after you have written is the same thing that you've written, right? So if you read from these three replicas and you get something else, then you need to know how, what is your algorithm to read the right data. So read after write consistency is an important property to keep in mind. And monolithic reads, monotonic reads, sorry, is important as well. Let's say you write a few things in order A, B, and C. Then when you read it, you should also read it in the same order A, B, and C. Because let's say I, I if I don't, then the reads are, not in the sequence. So right sequence of reads is an important property to keep in mind as well. Consistent prefix of reads is also important, uh, which, which, which is the same factor as ordering. You want to order your writes and reads. There are certain algorithms that enable you to have um, a clear um, conflict resolution, which says last writer wins is another way. Uh, eventual consistency is what this whole thing is about, right? Right. Um, at some point, asynchronous or synchronous, the data eventually gets consistent, but what is that time duration for eventual consistency is the key thing to keep in mind. Uh, monotonic reads uh, make sure that you don't see data in a sequence, out of sequence. But there is, if you look at all of this, right, think about how Google Docs would be working, which system would they be using, and how it allows for multiple users across various geographies to edit the same document, the same field. So there's a lot of detail there that we can do it offline and operational transform is algorithm that they use. But this whole thing comes down to one thing, convergence, convergence of data, right? And convergence, the promise here is the eventual consistency with a key takeaway to keep in mind, the application owners you and I as application developers, there's a lot of responsibility to support distributed systems and, and systems which support for scaling to allow for all of these capabilities, but the application owner needs to know about how these things work so that they can resolve conflicts, they can make sure that data is actually consistent, that the algorithm that they read is efficient, high latency is avoided for the user, and, and it's able to scale to multiple users. So this was database replication. I will see you all in the next chapter. Thanks.